Listener Production. Hi, I'm Sasha Barbagat. Welcome to The Briefing. Last night, Treasurer Jim Chalmers handed down his third budget, the country's economic plan for the next four years and beyond. This is a budget for the here and now, and it's a budget for the decades to come. It's a responsible budget that helps people under pressure today and invests in the promise and potential of the more prosperous future that we can make together. For most of us, the federal budget is pretty boring, but it is important, and it's undoubtedly the biggest news story of the day. This is also likely to be the last full budget paper handed down by the Albanese government before the next election, so a lot is riding on this for Labor. So this episode, Katrina Blowers and I are breaking down the top five things that matter the most and how they impact you. It is Wednesday, the 15th of May. Happy post-budget day, Katrina. Look, there weren't many surprises last night, but there was one in the government's cost of living relief, wasn't there? Yeah, I mean, I've been covering budgets for years now and normally you do get a lot of leaks in the weeks or sometimes months beforehand. But I felt with this budget, pretty much everything was out in the open except for the energy bill relief, which we also knew that was coming. We just didn't know how much and to whom. It turns out Every single Australian, whether you're rich, very rich, um, you're a boomer, you're travelling the countryside in your caravan, um, look, they're the people that probably don't need this energy bill relief, um, but all the other people will get it too who do need it. So that is great news. And we'll get $300 off our energy bill come July. They're going to be automatically credited to our bills as a $75 saving per quarter. Um, a million small businesses are going to get some relief in that space too, $325 off their energy bills. Uh, It was super interesting to see Jim Chalmers being grilled overnight about why it was that he was giving it to everybody and not means testing it. And he said, look, cost of living pressure is happening right up and down the scale. And he kept being asked, well, not to rich people. And he said, look, this was just the easiest way of, of applying it is to put it straight on the bills. And I've been thinking about it, Sasha. Why did he do it that way? Mm. And, and he said, look, it was, it was a simple and effective way to make sure the money went to everyone. Cause what they don't want, I suppose, is to give people the cash and then for that cash, to flow through the economy. The other thing that it will do is it will um, reduce the points for energy from the consumer price index and, and bring that down. So it will mean that things won't cost us as much in real terms and that will hopefully keep a lid on inflation. But it's a risky strategy, isn't it, Sasha? Yeah, and that's what I I did watch that 7.30 interview with the Treasurer and he was being grilled on that as well. Well, how is this going to avoid driving up inflation and he couldn't answer it. Uh, And, you know, a lot of what the government has put in last night's budget is all aimed at trying to keep inflation down and drive it down. But we know that a lot of it goes beyond uh, government control as well. There are a lot of external factors at play here. Look, I thought it'd be also worth touching on what else we saw um, in cost of living relief. So the rent assistance has been increased by 10%. So that'll benefit around a million households. And that relief is targeted directly at people who are struggling the most. Uh, we also will see cheaper medicines. So there's going to be a cap on pricing for PBS listed drugs. So for the next year, it'll be capped at $31.60. So that's for any prescription prescription that is listed on the PBS. But for concession card holders and pensioners, it'll be just $7.70. So that's another cost of living relief measure that the government is looking to, you know, offer to people without handing over cash. It's like, okay, well, let's keep your medicines a little bit cheaper. And the other measure that we've seen that we already knew about was hex debt relief. So this is targeted at younger Australians and people with a hex debt still. uh, And that'll centre around indexation charges to make sure that people aren't being charged indexation at the higher rate. It'll be at the lower rate, whether that's CPI or wage price index. Uh, And as I mentioned, yeah, Chalmers is walking a pretty fine tightrope to try to deliver 
relief without adding to inflation. But he reckons this is the right balance, Katrina, so time will tell. Yeah, and I mean, these bill relief measures, which we're talking about money that people are going to have to spend anyway. It's not that they're um, asking people to spend money on on other things uh, and they're not giving them cash, crucially. They're, they're deducting it from the bills. It just depends what those people then do with the extra money. Jim Chalmers seems to think that people are so stretched financially right now that they'll be very grateful and put it towards, you know, buying the basics like groceries or um, perhaps even saving it. But yeah, if it's going to once again stimulate demand in the economy, having that extra money, particularly because we're seeing older Australians who might not need that relief, um, yeah, it could have the opposite effect. And look, we can't talk about cost of living without talking about these stage three tax cuts. Let's hear what Jim Chalmers said about it last night. Our new tax cuts for middle Australia are the biggest part of the cost of living relief in this budget. From July 1, all 13.6 million taxpayers will get a tax cut. And for 84 per cent of taxpayers and 90 per cent of taxpaying women, a bigger tax cut than they would have under the previous government. This is about rewarding the hard work of our nurses and teachers and truckies and tradies. And the 2.9 million people earning $45,000 a year or less who would have received nothing. The average benefit is $1,888 a year, which is $36 a week. We already knew about this one, Katrina, and interestingly, uh, that word middle Australia is being thrown around and I heard Jim Chalmers talk about it a lot last night. There's quite a a big cohort of very angry people who are fed up with what's going on with the cost of living and they're desperate for relief. And a lot of the uh, support or relief has been targeted in the past at at those who need it the most, our, our lower income earners and people on uh, disability support or our aged care pensioners. And I've noticed this kind of shift in rhetoric a lot with this budget is talking about middle Australia and, and how this budget is going to help them. He did mention as well in that uh, grab childcare and aged care workers uh, and how this will help them. The other help they're getting in this budget is is cash for a pay rise as well, which has been set aside by the government. So yeah, really trying to target middle Australia. And, and that's clear by a lot of the rhetoric that we heard last night. Yeah. And again, great. Like who, who doesn't want or need more money in their pockets right now, particularly the, the middle and low income earners. But again, it's, um, you know, a, another example where higher income earners are going to have more money in their pockets too. Not as much as they would have under Scott Morrison, but they still will. Uh, economists have been kind of tearing their hair out over whether that money swishing around the economy will have an inflationary effect. Um, One economist yesterday cited some data that said for the last few months, Australians have been spending 97 cents in every dollar that they earn. So that suggests to me, I don't think, you know, the people I know are certainly going out there having fancy dinners out. And if you look at the the figures, the spending figures, um, you know, discretionary spending in those areas are down. So look, it does indicate people are at the margins. It does indicate that possibly this is the right call and that the money may not have an inflationary effect. But yeah, again, it all rests with what the people at the top end of town do. Absolutely. And let's move on now to one of the other big talking points from last night. And it's one that I think we're going to hear more and more about, and it's called Future Made in Australia. To realise the opportunities of a future made in Australia, we're changing the way that we attract and deploy investment in our economy. So this is a $22.7 billion centrepiece policy from this federal government. And what it's aiming to do is throw cash uh, at businesses to encourage them to adopt clean technology and to manufacture it and to get involved so that we can... It, 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 the idea is that it's going to push our economy into the next phase and it should all centre around renewables. Katrina, what did you make of this one? 
Yeah, and also bring back, crucially, um, the heartland of what used to be Labor voters, blue-collar workers, back to the party who have all gone elsewhere um, by creating jobs for and opportunities for, for those workers. Look, I got excited when I first heard him say global net zero future. I thought, oh, here we go. We're going to get some spending on the environment. And yep. actually, there aren't really any budget measures in last night's budget specifically for the environment, there is the scrapping of the waste export levy, which the Morrison government announced back in 2020 to reduce and regulate waste exports, but no money put towards ensuring we can manage our own waste or that it won't go to landfill. Instead, all of the environmental heat has gone towards um, this Future Made in Australia program. And the, the idea behind it, although we don't know too much about it. The um, scheme is yet to be designed. But the idea is that Australian resources can go towards building this global net zero future. We're going to have some big tax incentives for green hydrogen and low carbon fuels. But again, those are only going to kick in from 2027. Um, We're also going to be mapping the geological potential of our country to figure out where all the, you know, the good stuff is underground. Uh, but, you know, this is off in the future. We've got to rely on industry actually taking this up and embracing it. So I see this as a big bit of a gamble. There's too many question marks around this for me, um, given it is such a major part of the budget. Mm, and as you uh, mentioned to us before we hit record, you went and looked at, you know, who could potentially be benefiting from this fund and uh, miners, including billionaires like Gina Reinhardt, are likely to benefit uh, from this which, you know, is one of the criticisms that's emerged. And as you mentioned, the details, the plan of this future made in Australia policy are still so blurry. So it sounds great on paper, but whether it can actually get us over the line is is a whole other story. Yeah, I was going through the list and I added up just how much money is going towards the companies that Gina Reinhart backs, and it is over a billion dollars. So that is just an incredible amount for rare earth mining and lithium development in her case. So I think, you know, Gina Reinhardt is one of the big winners from last night's budget. Let's talk about women. Now, this part of Jim Chalmers' speech had me sitting up and listening. Violence against women is a national shame and it requires our national action. We're delivering $925 million to establish the Permanent Leaving Violence Program, which takes our total investment to address violence against women to $3.4 billion. But we know that there is more work for all of us to do. So after he said that, I was waiting for an additional announcement. We knew about that almost $1 billion spend to help uh, women and children fleeing domestic violence situations in the form of $5,000 payments. We knew that was coming and, uh, you know, he said there's more to do and I waited with bated breath and there was nothing. There was nothing additional announced for domestic violence and violence against women except for the acknowledgement that more needs to be done, which we already knew as well. And advocates are also disappointed there wasn't more funding for domestic violence. Uh, Some ideas that have been thrown around include support for legal services for women fleeing domestic violence and also for Indigenous Australians as well, more support in that space. We did get some other announcements around women though. Uh, Again, one that had been uh, announced or leaked in the lead up to last night was superannuation to be paid on government funded paid parental leave. Women are currently retiring with 20 25% less than men in their super accounts. So this is aimed at closing that gap. Uh, A lot of women's health initiatives worth $56 million, uh, free period products for Aboriginal communities, uh, support for women and families who have suffered miscarriage. There's going to be funding for that. Also, uh, better training GPs to treat menopause, which I thought is interesting. I'm noticing that kind of really ticking along in the national conversation of getting us talking about menopause more and what that means for women. And we've also going to see higher rebates for longer consultations for complex gynecological conditions. Now, there's also going to be, Katrina, a gender audit of Medicare-funded services. Uh, So, 
that could look like the current rebate on ultrasounds. So right now, just an interesting little tidbit, the rebate for scrotum ultrasounds is significantly higher than that for female pelvic ultrasounds. So there's going to be a look at that to be going, well, hang on, why are we seeing that and can we make it more fair? So there is a lot of, I think, positives in this budget for women, especially around women's health, which, as I mentioned, we're seeing that more and more talking about things like endometriosis and and menopause and period care. But I'm bitterly disappointed that there isn't a stronger show of support to end domestic violence and violence against women. Yeah, and also to reduce the gender pay gap even further, um, last night the Treasurer said, you know, quite triumphantly, the gender pay gap is the lowest it's ever been, but there still is one. So it would have been nice to get some initiatives on that too. Yeah, definitely. I could not agree more. Look, let's wrap it up, Katrina, by gazing into the crystal ball, which is what we're often asked to do uh, by governments come budget time. They want us to believe that everything's kind of going to go really well for the next 12 months. So let's look at what Jim Chalmers has promised. Now, Treasury is pretty optimistically forecasting inflation will fall to the target band of under 3% by the end of this year and be down to 2.75% by the middle of 2025. On the flip side, the Reserve Bank forecasts indicate inflation will be at 3.8% in December this year uh, and still be up at 3.2% in June next year. So it's worth noting the RBA's forecast did not include any sort of budget announcements in, in their forecast. So, you know, that could change what the RBA is predicting. But I think the important thing to note here is that the government is being incredibly optimistic with these figures. And the impact of having things like inflation not go down and interest rates staying where they are or even potentially going up again, that will be a bit of a black mark on this government, especially after this budget, where the rhetoric is cost of living relief is coming. And that's all about inflation. That's all about interest rates. And so if we don't see that happen, as they're promising, come May next year when we head to the polls, I think they'll feel it. Definitely. I mean, it is a risky strategy and um, it relies on the RBA governor fronting up to the meeting potentially next month and saying, oh, now that I've seen the budget, everything changes. But what happens if she changes nothing? And that means that potentially, as she flagged, rates could even go up again or they might not be likely to fall until the end of next year, which would be after that crucial election date. And that's not just embarrassing, but it's it's a credibility issue too. Um, the government's budget measures might actually increase inflation. That's the other thing that could go wrong, um, meaning that we don't just get one rate hike, but potentially several more. So it, it is, I feel, a risky strategy because it relies on a couple of things that are completely out of the government's control at the end of the day. Inflation, it is largely out of the government's control and also whether business are going to uh, completely embrace the Future Made in Australia program because that is such a um, a, a key part of, of this budget and the projected revenue going forward. So yeah, I'll be watching closely. I think it's a fascinating time. Mm, absolutely. Katrina, I think we've covered all of the biggest bits. Of course, there's a lot more in there, uh, but those are the things that I think our listeners should care about and uh, that we should all be keeping an eye on as we go forward. Thanks so much for being here, Katrina. Thank you to our listeners for sticking through this budget chat. Uh, We appreciate you joining us. Remember, you can check out all our other video content uh, on TikTok, on Instagram and on YouTube as well. And uh, we will be back the Savo with another episode of The Briefing. Thanks so much for listening. Listener.